and it was in the latter part of July. And I told him, I said, just don't worry. <laughs> I said, if it's like all of the other meetings that I conduct, I said, we'll take care of it before the week is over with. Well, it started raining on Tuesday morning real early. And it continued to rain and continued to rain. And Wednesday evening, this Brother Bailey came around and he said, Brother Allen said, I don't know what in the world you have done but said, you're gonna to have to do something to stop this rain. <laughs> said, if you don't stop this rain, the boll weevils are gonna eat us up. <laughs> so you just went from one direction to another direction. So I was telling Brother John and Sister Chick Derling the other day that I left here in a snowstorm last year, and I came back in a snowstorm this year, but there are blessings associated with that. When I lived in Denver, Colorado for almost seven years, we always admired the beauty of God's creation during these periods of time. But there are problems associated with it, I'm aware of that, but at the same time, we can look and we can observe the beauty as God has in his creation. This morning, during the Bible class worship, I want to begin a topic, if I may, and talk about it for about 30 minutes. And then we'll let this bleed over, as it were, into the worship period. And it has to do with God's scheme of redemption. And when I think concerning the word of the Lord, and I think concerning the Bible, there's a lot of things that come to my mind, and that is that you need to be very, very careful about defining your words. Words have a tremendous impact upon the mind of mankind. If you don't think that they do, you just use the word mother and begin thinking what that means to you. You use the word father and immediately there are the emotions and the intellect that is involved in it. You use the expression Valentine's Day and immediately there are things that come to your mind in that respect. You think concerning the word wife, you think concerning the word husband, and I could go on to illustrate many other words that have great impact upon our minds and upon our feelings. But this is with the way it is with the word of the Lord. Someone told me on one occasion, said, when I'm reading the Bible, if I see a word and I don't know what it is, that I just kind of stumble or cough a little bit and it just go on. That's one of the greatest mistakes that you can make. If you're reading something and there is a word there, that word is conveying something to your mind. And if you don't understand what it is, you need to stop for a minute, get a dictionary of New Testament words, you need to look it up and you need to find out what that word means. Now what I'm about to say is not for the purpose of criticizing the King James translation of the Bible because I believe it to be a very good translation. But the King James translation of the Bible was brought into existence in 16 and 11. And at that time, there were a lot of the words that was used then that don't mean the same thing as they do now. On Wednesday evening this week, we're gonna be talking about the word Sheol from the Old Testament and the word Hades from the New Testament, one from Hebrew and the other is from Greek. And from this standpoint then, we're thinking concerning uh, a mistranslation in the King James Version in which they translated it hell, where those words appeared. And then there are problems that develop from that, but we'll be talking about that on Wednesday evening. So you need to stop and you need to think concerning these words as to what they mean. If you look at the word prevent in the King James translation of the Bible, it doesn't mean what you think it means today in the English language. When you think concerning other words that are found in the New Testament, we need to be careful as it were concerning those words and make sure that we understand the meaning of them. I want to call your attention, if you will please, to a passage of scripture that's quite interesting and we'll find this as a starting point. In the book of Colossians, the first chapter in verse 26, 
In this verse, the word of the Lord says, even the mystery which hath been hid for ages and generations, but now hath it been manifested to his saints. Now when I look at this passage of scripture and I look at the word that is used here, now all of a sudden I'm thinking, if you will please, concerning the word mystery. The word mystery. I look at that word and the first thing I think that a lot of individuals think about is that here is something that has a plot and, and you're reading along as it were in a book of mystery and you're thinking concerning it unfolding ultimately in the end and, and you're going along cautiously waiting for that. Well, this is not the idea that's de, de, that is set forth in the word of the Lord. Look at verse 26 again, if you will, in Colossians, the first chapter, in which he simply says, even the mystery which has been hid for ages and generations. Now observe, if you will, please, that something has been hid. Not only has it been hid, but he says it's been hid for ages and for generations. Now I call your attention to the fact that he's talking about something that was not made known, but something that is about to be made known. So here is something that was not revealed before, but now it has been revealed, and the next part of that verse says that very, th that very thing. But now has it been manifested to his saints, now has it been revealed to the saints. Here, if you please, is God's scheme of redemption that in olden times was not made known but has now been made known unto those that were designated as apostles and prophets and those that are designated in this text as the saints of God. So when I think concerning the word mystery, I'm thinking concerning that which was not made known but is now made known, that which in times past was hidden but is not now hidden, that which in days gone was not revealed, but has now been revealed, and I'm confident as we press along, you'll come to realize that it has reference to the word of God that was not made known in the Old Testament, but it is now made known in the New Testament. Come with me to another passage of scripture now, if you will, in the book of Ephesians, the third chapter, and I'll begin with verse eight. And in verse 8, he's talking about some things that has to do with the eternal purpose of God. The eternal purpose of God. Let me begin with verse 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of all the saints, was this grace given to preach unto the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the dispensation of the mystery. Now there's our word. Right there, you see. Here is that which was not made known, but that which is in, uh, has been made known. And in this context, he's talking about the Gentiles which were not blessed, but have now been blessed by that which has been revealed. I'm coming back to verse 9 again now. And to make all men see what is the dispensation of the mystery, which for ages has been hid in God, who created all things to the intent that now under the principalities and the powers and the heavenly places might be made known through the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now here, if you please, is that which was hid, that which is made known. Now he's doing exactly the same thing that he did over in Colossians 1 and verse 26. He said there's something that was hidden for ages and for generations, that it was not revealed. And lo and behold, here is something now that has been revealed. So this that is designated as a mystery is just simply something that was not made known, but is now made known. And is talking about the eternal purpose, verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus. Sometimes when you're hearing individuals talking about the mind of God in the beginning, you hear them talking about him having two plans. And the idea is that there is a plan that if man should sin, that plan will be activated. On the other hand, there was a plan that if man did not sin, that plan would be activated. Not too long ago, I had an individual to challenge me on that thinking, and he said, Brother Allen, tell me something. Where in the word of the Lord did you ever read 
concerning there being a plan for Adam and Eve, for instance, in the Garden of Eden, had they not sinned, and on the other hand, a plan if they did sin. And I said, well, first of all, do you remember God saying in the Garden of Eden that of all the trees that are therein, thou mayest freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that I shall not eat thereof? Here's a requirement now. That said, well, don't eat of that tree, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, until they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they were pursuing one course. The very minute that they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, there was a breach, if you please, that was made between God and man, and in this case, the man and the woman, and they were cast outside the Garden of Eden. But here's the point I want you to get. When he was put outside, thinking concerning Adam, of the Garden of Eden, there was a cherubim of fire that was placed at the entrance to the Garden of Eden, watch the statement now, lest they enter back therein and partake of the tree of life and thus be sustained forever. There's one plan that be sustained forever. But the very fact that Adam and Eve sinned, here is another plan now that begins to unfold. And the first mention of it is in Genesis 3 and verse 15. The seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. Now here, if you please, is what is hid. Here is what was not made known. And that is how to get man back into covenant relationship with God. And over a period of generations, decades, generations, uh, you find this being hid, but now all of a sudden it is manifested through Jesus Christ, through the apostles, through prophets, and so on. And here is the scheme of redemption. Here's God's plan of salvation that is made known. Over in the book of First Peter, there's an interesting statement made in the first chapter, and it's talking about the very thing that we're talking about here. And he simply says, beginning with verse 10. 1 Peter, the first chapter, and verse 10. Concerning which, what's that word now? Salvation. Concerning which salvation the prophets sought and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto them, searching what time or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did point unto, when it testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glories that should follow them, to whom it was revealed that not unto themselves. They didn't know what the answer was. They looked for it. They sought and they searched. They thought about it. They worried about it. They thought concerning the things that was being revealed, as it were. But they didn't know because here, as Isaiah says, is a little bit. There's a little bit over here and over yonder and so on. They were trying to put all the pieces together and they couldn't. And now we're back to Colossians 1 verse 26. We're back to Ephesians, the third chapter, beginning with verse 10. These things were hid in God. And yet at the same time, God was making known just a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit over here, a little bit over there. And finally it came to fruition in the New Testament. And here's what we refer to as the revelation of God's revealed will. There's another place that I want to call to your attention because I'm going to have an opportunity to talk about it a little more in a moment or two. And it's found in the book of Ephesians, the fifth chapter, and here we're thinking again concerning this word mystery. That which was not made known, but which is now made known. So in the book of Ephesians, the fifth chapter, beginning with verse 22 and continuing down through verse 33, there are some things that are taught, but first of all, let me suggest something to you now. <clears throat> Almost invariably, when I turn to Ephesians, the fifth chapter, and began with verse 22 and continue with verse 33, here someone says, oh, Brother Allen, that's Paul's lesson on marriage. No, no. No, no. Now, marriage is discussed. But this is not Paul's lesson on marriage. Marriage is used to illustrate the church, and I'm going to show you in just a moment or two. The lesson has to do with the church and Jesus Christ. The sub-point is the marriage relationship. Watch the text, if you will, please, down in the fifth chapter and at verse 31. For this cause a man leave, she is to leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, 
and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery, there's that word mystery now. This mystery is great, but I speak in regard of Christ and the church. There's the point of emphasis. Now, has he said anything about the marriage relationship that is not true? No, no. Not at all. Everything that he says is true. But the primary point has to do with the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he in this context, and we'll connect this together later, maybe it will be in the next hour. But it has to do with the Gentiles and the Jews being reconciled in the one body, the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ coming into existence, and all mankind being invited into it through obedience to that scheme of redemption. So now I'm back, if you please, over in the book of Ephesians, the third chapter, and beginning with about verse 10. And here the Apostle Paul is speaking concerning the eternal purpose of God. Here is something that has been in the mind of God from the very beginning. And when man sinned, now all of a sudden, in Genesis 3 and verse 15, the first time that it was made known is that the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. We've got a hint concerning what's going to be in the future. <clears throat> now, on Monday evening, I'm going to be talking about the Holy Spirit and his work. And it has to do with the revelation of God's word. On Tuesday evening, we're going to be talking about connecting all of the things together from the Old Testament to the New Testament, how that they are entwined, how that they're knit together, and how that you have to consider them all together. And this is just one of the points that's being made here in Genesis 3 and verse 15. The seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent, go way over yonder to the book of Galatians, the fourth chapter, and in God's own good time, here is Jesus Christ that comes, born of a woman, Here's the seed of the woman, you see. It all connects together. Yet make no difference what is said in the Old Testament. It agrees perfectly with that which is said in the New Testament or whatever is said in the New Testament. It agrees perfectly with that which is taught in the Old Testament. But here is the scheme of redemption that has been hidden. Here is the scheme of redemption that has not been made known. Here is the scheme of redemption now all of a sudden that comes as it were in Romans 1 and verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, there's another word that comes into focus that we need to take into consideration just for a moment, and it's what I just quoted to you. <clears throat> the word gospel simply carries with it the idea of good news. Good news. In olden times, that is in the Old Testament, there was a message that was given and extended to the Jewish people. This was God's people. As time passed along, here is Jesus Christ that comes into existence, by that I mean upon the face of this earth. And as he comes in human form, ultimately he dies upon the cross, and the word of the Lord said he nailed the law to the cross. And when he nailed the law to the cross, now all of a sudden, here is the gospel of Jesus Christ that's extended to all mankind. But you know, the interesting thing about that is that the very thing that we were talking about had not dawned upon the apostles. For in Acts, the second chapter, the word of the Lord says, for the promises to you and to your children and to all of them that are far off. Do you think they understood that at that time? No, they didn't understand that. When Peter came down to the household of Cornelius in Acts the 10th chapter in verse 34, he says, Now I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. He didn't know that before. He taught it because he was speaking, Acts 2 and verse 4, as the Holy Spirit gave him utterance. He didn't understand the things that were being said, but as time went along and he thought about it, put the pieces together, got down to Acts the 10th chapter with the conversion of Cornelius, he says, Now I know God's extended the gospel to the Gentiles. Here now uh, is the gospel that goes forth both to the Jew and to the Gentile, both the barbarian and to that which is designated as the free. Goes forth to those that are men, men and goes forth to those that are women. It goes forth as it were to all mankind upon the face of this earth, whoever it may be. Here's the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. Now I want to show you something now, and, and I'm going to piece the pieces together in just a moment or two. This gospel is the same thing as that mystery. You see, it's that New Testament dispensation. It's that word of God. It's that scheme of redemption. 
That is made known. Let me put another word up here, if I may, in connection with this, and I think that you'll see a relationship to this. <clears throat> there is in the New Testament the word faith that is used not in the sense of an individual's faith, but in sense of the New Testament word, that New Testament system. For instance, in Jude 3, contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered. You see, here is that which was not delivered, not made known, but then is made known. Here is that faith in Jude 3, contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered. So that was not made known in times past, but now it's made known to the saints. The word faith in this passage of scripture has to do with the scheme of redemption. It has to do with the New Testament. What we commonly refer to is the 27 books of the New Testament. So I'm looking, if you please, concerning the word faith that is used here. There is another time that the word faith is used, and it's used from the standpoint of a system of faith. And this is found in the book of Romans, the first chapter. Now, I don't mind telling you that this passage of Scripture caused me no little problem for several years, and it took a while for me to get on to what was being talked about, but all of it was housed in the words and how words are used. Read with me in verse 16, if you will, please. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, verse 17. For therein is revealed the righteousness of God from faith unto faith. You wrestle with that problem. From faith unto faith. I worked, I talked, I thought. I woke up in the middle of the night many times thinking, what in the world is he talking about? From faith unto faith. I had to ultimately come to the conclusion, as the word of the Lord teaches, that Romans 10 and verse 17 says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing from the word of God. What I believe is the evidence that is presented in the word of God. And that's what causes my faith. That's what he's describing in Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I look at that substance, I look at that evidence, and it causes me, watch it now, to have faith. Causes me to have faith. But watch now, a moment ago in Jude 3, contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered unto the saints. You have another way that that word is used over in the book of Galatians, the third chapter. Here the apostle Paul is speaking, if you please, concerning the word faith having reference to the scheme of redemption or to the New Testament system. What verse 23. Galatians, the third chapter, and verse 23. But before faith came, what's he talking about there? Well, he's talking about that which was revealed. Look at it further now. Before faith came, we were kept in ward under the law, shut up under the, uh, under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. There's our word. That's the point that's been made, you see. Here's the faith that is revealed. Okay, where do I get my personal faith from? The faith that is revealed. Now back in Romans first chapter in verse 17, from faith unto faith, here is that system of faith, first of all, that is delivered, and as a result of the system of faith being delivered, now I have faith in my heart because of what I believe from the faith. And thus he simply designates in Romans the first chapter that that is from faith unto faith, it comes from the system of faith, the scheme of redemption, to residing within my heart a deep conviction concerning the evidence and concerning the proof of things as it's set forth in God's holy and divine word. That constitutes my faith. But I got one more word. <clears throat> got one more word that I want to talk to you about for a moment or two, and then we will observe something else in the next hour. It have to, has to do, associated with Jesus, and I'm thinking one thing, and I'm writing something else on the board. So let me erase this just for a moment, and let me put another thought here, and it has to do with the word truth. Has to do with the word truth. Now what I was thinking about when I wrote Jesus on the board was found in John 1 and verse 17. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Okay, here's the system, if you please, the law of Moses. 
that God had revealed unto the Jewish people. Okay, here's another system. Here's the scheme of redemption. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And that's what's being talked about, if you please, in the book of Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verses 16 and 17. Before there can be a testament, there has to be the death of a testator. When Jesus died upon the cross, truth came into existence. That's his testament. That's his law. In John 17 and 17, he said, Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. You can begin, as it were, with the first verse of the book of Genesis, conclude with the last verse of the book of Revelation, and everything that is there in between is what is designated as truth. But here in this passage of Scripture, we have the word of the Lord, John 1 and verse 17, that's being talked about that New Testament system, the scheme of redemption that is opposed to the law of Moses, and the reason why is that the blood of animals, bulls, and goats could not take away the sins of the world, but here is something that does take away the sins of the world, and that has to do with this scheme of redemption, that has to do with this gospel, that has to do with this mystery, that has to do with this faith, that has to do with this truth. And that's what God has delivered to us to live by in New Testament times. Now the Lord willing, we'll take up here at the normal period of our worship service and we'll begin and we'll continue with what I'm going to be talking about a little later. And if you will, please, we'll just leave this on the board that I have here because I'm going to have an occasion to use it again in a moment or two. Thank you very much for listening to me so kindly.